Good morning and welcome to Fairlawn Avenue United Church on this 13th day of February. It is good to gather from wherever we find ourselves today. We're glad that you've joined us. Our Director of Music, Eleanor Daly, provides us week by week with a brilliant online music bulletin to enhance our online worship service. So please scroll down to the link below this video. Your worship service is not complete until that is a part of it as well. This morning's service has a Valentine's theme. We'll be exploring love through poetry, scripture, prayer, and song. At its heart, love is about presence, about reassurance of the other, about our place in the universe, our hearts yearning to love and be loved, to understand and to be understood. Let us pray. O oh God, our conceiver, the God of surprises, shaping the sea, the stars, the planets and people, gather us into your circle of love. O oh God, our redeemer, the icon of caring, gurgling, crying, a Bethlehem babe, gather us into your circle of love. O oh God, our inspirer, the breather of life, flickering, dancing, like flames of a candle, gather us into your circle of love. Great God, three in one, great God, one in three, gather us today into your circle of love. Amen. We have three readers for today with very short meditations from me after each. So our first reader is Maury Ewing on the theme of fierce love and how to be alive in the world. Fierce love, how to be alive in the world. How wonderful it is when an ancient sacred text speaks with a seemingly contemporary voice. Reading from the Song of Solomon, chapter eight, verses six to seven. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. For love is strong as death, passion fierce as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, a raging flame. Many waters cannot quench it, neither can floods drown it. If one offered for love all the wealth of one's house, it would be utterly scorned. And reading from Richard Rohr, these words. In our current context, race and ethnicity, caste and color, gender and sexuality, socioeconomic status and education, religion and political party have all become reasons to divide and be conquered by fear and rancor. Put simply, we are in a perilous time, and the, question, the answer to the question, who are we to be, will have implications for generations to come. We have a choice to make. We can answer this question with diminished imagination by closing ranks with our tribe and hiding from our human responsibility to heal the world. Or we can answer the question of who we are to be another way. We can answer it in the spirit of Ubuntu. The concept comes from the Zulu phrase Umuntu, Ngumuntu, Ngabantu, which literally means that a person is a person through other people. Another translation is, I am who I am because we are who we are. With this in mind, who I will be is deeply related to who you are. In other words, we are each impacted by the circumstances that impact those around us. What hurts you, hurts me. What heals you, heals me. What causes you joy, causes me to rejoice. And what makes you sad, also causes me to weep. By channeling the ancient wisdom of Ubuntu, we can engineer a badly needed love revolution to rise up out of the ashes of our current reality. The empathy that grows from listening to others, from connecting with our neighbors, 
and from loving our neighbors as we love ourselves, can define the courses of action we take. Finally, from Howard Thurman, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and go do it. Because the world, what the world needs is more people who have come alive. First reflection. So love is fierce. It is strong. Waters cannot quench it. Floods cannot drown it. And the spirit of Ubuntu shows us a stronger, gentler, fiercer way of seeing the other, of widening our circle of love, not diminishing it, making us all more alive, more present to the God of love. You and I belittle God's love whenever we fail to see the spirit in another, whenever our culture, our race, our language, our worth separates us from full humanity. Look at our world. Look at our great separations growing wider by the day, our growing fear and exclusionary thinking. This is not a time to make our circles of love smaller, to draw lines between people and nations and faiths. It is not a time to lose hope. It is not a time to hide away. It is not a time to fear love and connection, but a time to stand firm. It is a time, in Howard Thurman's words, to come alive, to be more fully present to the other, to the Spirit of God, urging us on to compassion and understanding and deep love for all of humanity. Our second reader is Rosalie Cowan on the theme of Creatures Great and Small. All creatures great and small. Job 12, verses 7 to 10. But ask the animals, and they will teach you. Or the birds in the sky, and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth, and it will teach you. Or let the fish in the sea inform you. Which of all these does not know that the hand of Yahweh has done this? In whose hand is a soul? of every creature, and the breath of all humanity. Little Dog's Rhapsody in the Night by Mary Oliver He puts his cheek against mine and makes small, expressive sounds. And when I'm awake, or awake enough, he turns upside down his four paws in the air and his eyes dark and fervent. Tell me you love me, he says. Tell me again. Could there be a sweeter arrangement? Over and over he gets to ask, and I get to tell. A second poem by Mary Oliver. I asked Percy how I should live my life. Love, love, love says Percy, and hurry as fast as you can along the shining beach or the rubble or the dust. Then go to sleep. Give up your body heat, your beating heart. Then trust. And finally, a quote by Rumi. Your task is not to seek for love, but merely to seek and find all the barriers within yourself that you have built against it. 
I returned yesterday to Toronto from Prince Edward Island, where I spent almost three weeks at my daughter's house with uh, my two grandsons and their household with animals and plants. I thought I'd tell you just a little bit about what's there to give you a sense of it. So they have two dogs, Luna, who is a great, gorgeous, gentle German Shepherd who takes up the whole couch when she decides to curl up with you. Kaylee, who's a teacup Yorkie and incredibly noisy. There are two cats, Charlie and Jack, and they are really the bosses of the household. There's Garrett, who is a 20-year-old gecko and really quite a marvelous creature. There are three fish tanks on the bottom floor of the house with a, a tank with tank loads of just wonderfully colored fish. And there are 94 plants. I've counted them because I've had to water them. 94 plants, some big and some small. This house, which is a house I used to live on, backs onto a small family-owned beef farm. There are lovely sounds that come from the farm and smells that come from the farm into Sarah's house. There's the lowing of the cattle. There's the braying of the donkeys. The donkeys are there to keep the coyotes away. Just wonderful scents, both outside their house and inside of the presence of creatures in our lives. Mary Oliver says of her dog, Percy, when I'm awake, he turns upside down, his four paws in the air, his eyes dark and fervent. Tell me you love me, he says. Tell me again. Could there be a sweeter arrangement? There is the ancient Israelite story, which is in Genesis, that says God made all the animals and brought them to Adam to be named. It seems to me that once you have named a creature, there is an obligation to care for and honor and even love that creature. And it also seems to me, even if you don't have that close a relationship, that in fact it is our responsibility as humans to care for and look after and honor the creatures of this world. Do you know how it's more likely in a small farm where animals are intimately are known and understood, it's more likely that they will be cared for and honored and respected. Large factory farms, it's simply impossible for that to happen. And in our world today, we are struggling to know how we honor the rights of animals. So there's all sorts of talk about the fact that animals should have their own rights in law. I think it's a concept that fits into our faith understanding that the whole world was created to be in harmony with one another. And that means as humans, we have to live in harmony with the other creatures of the world. Rumi says we are to find the barriers within ourselves that we have built against love. And the Percy's of our world attest to this truth. Our last reader is Amanda Hancocks on the theme of the light in all things. The Light in All Things. From the Gospel of Thomas, hear these words. Yeshua says, I am the light, shining upon all things. I am the sum of everything, for everything has come forth in me, and towards me everything unfolds. Split a piece of wood, and there I am. Pick up a stone, and you will find me there. Forgive Me by Mary Oliver. Angels are wonderful, but they're so, well, aloof. It's what I sense in the mud and the roots of trees 
or the well or the barn or the rock with its citron map of lichen that halts my feet and makes my eyes flare, feeling the presence of some spirit, some small God who abides there. If I were a perfect person, I would be bowing continuously. I'm not, though I pause whenever I feel this holiness, which is why I'm often so late coming back from wherever I went. Forgive me. From Wendell Berry's The Unforeseen Wilderness, Kentucky's Red River Gorge. And the world cannot be discovered by a journey of miles, no matter how long but only by a spiritual journey, a journey of one inch, very arduous and humbling and joyful, by which we arrive at the ground at our own feet and learn to be at home. There must be always, remaining in every life, some place for the singing of angels, some place for that which in itself is breathless and beautiful. Howard Thurman. Frederick Beekner wrote this. I think of a person I haven't seen or thought of for years, and 10 minutes later I see her crossing the street. I turn on the radio to hear a voice reading the biblical story of Yao, which is the story that I have spent the morning writing about. A car passes me on the road, and its license plates consist of my wife's and my initials side by side. When you tell people stories like that, their usual reaction is to laugh. One wonders why. I believe, he wrote, that people laugh at coincidence as a way of relegating it to the realm of the absurd and of therefore not having to take seriously the possibility that there's a lot more going on in our lives than we either know or care to know. Who can say what it is that's going on? But I suspect that part of it anyway is that every once and so often we hear a whisper from the wings that go something like this. You've turned up at the right place at the right time. You're doing fine. Don't ever think that you've been forgotten. The love of the Creator is not just for humans, not just for creatures, large and small, but it's also for the cosmos, for the stardust that is in all things. Do you know that feeling that you can get sometimes if you're outside the city in a darkened place where starlight and moonlight bears down upon you and you are so aware of the fragility of our small planet and the immense presence of galaxies and black holes and the unknown. You can get the same feeling if you go the other way and look at the small things that make up the whole. Wendell Berry says that we need to get to know the earth we stand on, the land where we live, one inch of which is enough to convince one that life in all its forms is incredibly complex and humbling. We need to learn to be at home where we find ourselves at the same time as we need to understand ourselves to be at home in the cosmos, whether it's small or it's large, it is still part of what it is to exist. There is so much our human mind cannot fathom, but we know awe and wonder, and sometimes we even know that we have not been forgotten by the love of the Creator, and because God has not forgotten us because we have not been forgotten, then we 
must not forget others. Love is to be shared. It is to be cherished. It is to be generously given. There must always be remaining in every life some place for the singing of angels, some place which in itself is breathless and beautiful. Thanks be to God for the love in our lives and the love we are to share. Amen. This morning's virtual musical offering features a double quartet singing, O ye who taste that love is sweet. The poem was written by the 19th century British poet, Christina Rossetti, and the music was composed by Eleanor Daly. Listen carefully to this gift of music and words. Oh, you. Coffee chat time is at 11.15 following this service. We will be blessing the knitters who make the shawls for our prayer shawl ministry. A reminder that if you are interested in learning about 2S LGBTQ plus identities, you can join us tomorrow, February the 14th at 7 p.m. on Zoom for an online virtual family-friendly pajama party and story time with Faye and Fluffy, two drag performers and experienced child educators. Kevin Doe of Fairlawns of Firm Ministry will host John Paul Kane and Caleb Robertson for a Q&I segment. For all of us who want to understand and be allies with this important community, 
with our families and our friends and our church. We encourage you to come along and learn tomorrow night. Please visit our website at www.fairlawnchurch.ca to register and receive the Zoom login details for tomorrow night's show. But also to see what's going on in Fairlawn, there might be some other things there that, uh, that you may be interested in participating. Today, we are blessing prayer shawls. And it's very fitting that our prayer shawl um, blessing and dedication is, um, is during our Valentine's service because it certainly is about this ministry. It's certainly about expressions of love and care. So let's listen as Jen Schley tells us about this vital Fairlawn ministry. Good morning. It's been a privilege and one of the most rewarding experiences of my life to coordinate, with the help of Barb Warner, Fairlawn's Prayer Shawl Ministry. Barb and I are grateful for the knitters who have given so generously of their time and love to create the almost 500 shawls that have been distributed to Fairlawn's members, family and friends over the past 11 years. I've shared stories with you in previous years during the blessing of the prayer shawls from some of the thank yous we've received. For today's Valentine service, as we celebrate the many aspects of love, I've chosen notes of appreciation that speak to the love the prayer shawls represent to those who receive them and those who give them. The letters also convey a sense of the deep importance of this ministry in the life of Fairlawn. First, from a grateful mum whose daughter was dealing with a challenging issue. Your gift of the shawl of loving embrace was the highlight of Christmas for our daughter, indeed for all of us. She burst into tears and was deeply moved to receive this gift of care and love. The true gifts come unasked and unexpected. The shawls offer both physical comfort and an expression of love. A new widow wrote, words cannot capture how grateful I am to receive this beautiful shawl. My husband wrapped himself in his shawl every day as he was always so cold. It provided him with warm comfort and love. I know I will feel the same with my shawl and also feel close to him. In this time of Zoom meetings and social distancing, the gift of the shawl represented a powerful, loving connection for a new member of Fairlawn's Breast Cancer Friends Group. It's a beautiful day which brings warmth, but it can't compare to the emotions in my heart for receiving this beautiful shawl. I'm in tears. I can feel the love that went into such an amazing gift. I want to thank the knitter for the hours she spent to create such a masterpiece. It's absolutely beautiful. I will use it daily, not only when it's chilly, but when I need a hug from the women in the support group, from God and from my special angels. A member of the congregation whose friend was beginning chemotherapy gave him a shawl as a tangible symbol of God's love. I found that being able to offer the shawl from the Fairlawn community gave my prayers and thoughts for my friend a wonderful reinforcement. It felt quite mighty to hand over this quiet reassurance of God's presence and love. And finally, prayer shawls offer loving affirmation that we are not alone. Please convey my heartfelt gratitude for our prayer shawl. It warmed our hearts. I'm truly touched by such kindness, by the grace of the shawl's warmth and the gift of love and reassurance it brings. A welcome calm to a troubled spirit. It's a gentle reminder that we are not alone. Knitters have always created items for others. Knit three, pearl three. 
it's the small things that can make an extraordinary difference in someone's life. Fairlawn's prayer shawls carry a powerful message of love, comfort, compassion, and connection that can often help to make that difference. If you would like to offer a shawl to someone, please email eb at fairlawnavenueunited.ca. Now that Jan has so beautifully shared her passion for the prayer shawl ministry, let us give this blessing to the shawls that will be going out to people over the next period of time. God of grace, we thank you for the ministry contained in and expressed by the knitting of these prayer shawls. We thank you for the people whose skill and care in knitting these shawls reminds us of the simple and powerful impact of touch, of embrace, on people for whom this expression of love is life-giving. May our blessing of these shawls extend to those who will receive them. May they feel the love, comfort, peace, and joy of your presence and feel a part of this community of faith. May these shawls shape a sacred place of security and well-being in good times and hard passages. May those who receive these shawls be wrapped in love. And may we endeavor to bring to all of our pastoral care for one another and for others, our care for the world and its peoples, creation in its fragile beauty, for justice and for peace, for life and hope. May we bring it to all, the patient craft, the intentional care, the persistence and commitment that characterizes this ministry and that is a witness to love for us all. Amen. Now let us pray. O living God, soften us. Let the fire of your love thaw the frost within us. Let the light of your justice sear away our blindness. Let the grace of your compassion heal our hardened hearts. O living God, soften us, that flowing with your grace we be impelled to face the world in bold compassion, that driven to justice we may dare to cry aloud for the little ones, the forgotten, the beaten, the imprisoned, and the hungry. O living God, soften us, sweep us forward in a mighty wave of mercy to heal our darkened world. Holy God, we pray now in silence for ourselves, our loved ones, for creatures of all sizes, for rocks and rivers and trees. We pray that you help us to be alive in your world. And now this blessing. May I live this day compassionate of heart, clear in word, gracious in awareness, courageous in thought, generous in love. Amen. Go in peace, my friends.